Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really grateful to be able to carry on in the tradition of the state of the school address. I was just talking to a parent of an eighth grader who said that this is the 15th um, consecutive state of the school address. And I said, you're always welcome to come back. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to convene with you all and to share with you the highlights of this year, what we're working on, what we're working towards. And I, I wanted to start with just gratitude. It is rare to find a community of educators where people are at once both incredibly proud of their practice and also really reflective and willing to grow and learn. And over the course of the past 21 months since I arrived at Bank Street, that's what I found here. And I'm incredibly grateful to my colleagues for all that they do every day in service of your children and our children. Um, I'm also grateful to you as parents. I have to make a confession and say that when I took this job, um, several of my educator friends said, you're nuts. You're going into the belly of the beast, New York City independent school parents. And I, I found that only to be partially true. Um, but I actually don't think that that's true. What I've found here is parents who are incredibly committed to their children and to the well-being of the community. So thank you as well. I want to take a moment to acknowledge parents who have just or will be joining the Bank Street community, we invited our newly admitted family. So if you're here as a newly admitted family, could you stand? And uh, um, I am acutely aware as a parent of 10-year-olds that time flies when you're having fun and also when you're not. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that I've heard myself saying recently quite a bit is that um, that childhood is not a dress rehearsal. You only really get one shot at it. And in that spirit, it feels wonderful to be in a community that truly cherishes and savors and celebrates childhood. And that's Bank Street. And so um, last year, the state of the school address was I don't know if you all recall, but it was on the day of silence um, to commemorate the struggles and lives of LGBTQ people. So my out was that I just didn't have to talk. This year, it's on uh, the National School Walkout. So I'm just going to be leaving in a couple of minutes. <laughs> and, and next year, I'm actually planning to just schedule it on Sunday during spring break. <laughs> um, so uh, without Further ado, I'm going to um, begin, and, and I think it's always helpful to talk about progressive education in the context of Bank Street and where we are. And so, um, I know you all chose this community because of our progressive roots, values, and history, and it's also important to constantly remind ourselves of what that means. And so, what I'm sharing with you is a quote by Margaret Wheatley from about 15 years ago from a piece called Willing to be Disturbed. And I'll just read it to you. It is very difficult to give up our certainties, our positions, our beliefs, our explanations. These help define us. They lie at the heart of our personal identity. Yet I believe we will succeed in changing this world only if we can think and work together in new ways. Curiosity is what we need. We don't have to let go of what we believe but we do need to be curious about what someone else believes. We do need to acknowledge that their way of interpreting the world might be essential to our survival. By the way, people don't need to take pictures of these. We'll send out the slides from the state of the school. Um, so I want to go from this sentiment, which I think is particularly prescient in this day, to a short clip of some work that last year's eighth graders did around the mock Congress unit. And I just want you to think about how Margaret Wheatley's sentiments play out in actual teaching 
in this clip from Bank Street. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have all gathered in this hallowed classroom to hear various politicians spew facts and opinions, trying to appeal to your sense of justice. There is scientific proof that the climate is changing and will always change. However, there is not much that the government can actually do to help this cause. The fact that some people believe that the government should rule over a woman's choice regarding her pregnancy proves that women are still not treated equally. Obamacare is a disaster. <laughs> As a gay male, LGBTQ rights are extremely important to me. The border is wide open, and as long as it's open, it's defenseless. Every American, regardless of race, class, or party affiliation, needs to wake up and realize that our country will not progress until we all come together. We must act as one. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen from, of the Senate. We are here today to discuss the Planned Parenthood bill. Senator Del Dio. This bill violates the 19th, the 9th Amendment, the right to privacy, which allows for anyone to have their own private records and to be able to make their own decisions about their medical care. I think the most challenging part for me was when the Republicans passed the Planned Parenthood bill. They had some pretty good arguments, and of course they just had simple majority. And um, so we were pretty disappointed that day, and it was a real challenge for us to come up with some inarguable um, arguments. But with the Planned Parenthood bill, there isn't a specific abortion fund, and so they were just trying to defund the organizations. I knew that I couldn't vote for that, so it was kind of hard to play. If you're defunding the most, like, the, the largest provider of abortions, where would you expect people to go? Well, I think that it's supposed to be inferred that there obviously will be a way provided to get an abortion. Are you going to say that you're going to create a government program? If, if so, then why is that not the bill? Right now, um, we're trying to pass the bill against abortions, which is sort of ironic um, because that's like the thing that I disagree most with my senator on. I'm trying to pass an education bill with the education committee. Currently, I'm working on a bill um, around racial profiling and police brutality so that um, alliances between communities and police officers and stations are built. So we have just a little bit of time to do some processing here. Let's start with substantive challenges and taking on these roles. Takashi. What happened a lot of times was where I had to remind myself that I wasn't being Takashi, I was being Senator Williams, who was very conservative from the South. Like at the beginning, I was shouting about how we need to destroy the EPA <laughs> and like all this stuff, and it, it was kind of ridiculous. And um, and it was just this, it was really a character. And as time went on, it became easier and easier to like understand and like click into the other side. I think that this activity really helped me become more open-minded. Like everybody's gonna disagree on something. And so I feel like once you like, are able to understand the beliefs and respect them, I feel like that's when like progress is made. So, so that doesn't happen by accident. Um, and let's remember those children are 13 and 14 years old. We as adults have a lot to learn from that. Um, but that's a culmination of a many year journey at Bank Street where children, among other things, are taught to think critically and, and be perspective takers. So as I talk a little bit about progressive education, those of you that are in the education circles know that there's a lot of buzz in the last decade or so about the necessity of 21st century skills. Um, and uh, so lots of schools and school districts are trying to figure out how to teach these essential competencies that are now known to pay dividends across a lifetime. And so um, a few years ago, Hanover Research conducted a study of six major frameworks about what constitutes, what are the essential 21st century skills that we're talking about. And what you can see in the left-hand column is the, the competencies that appeared in all six 
of the frameworks. In the middle column, you'll find the competencies that appear in, the, uh, in five of the six, and in the right-hand column, four out of the six. And if you take a close look at these competencies, what I can proudly say is that Bank Street has been teaching these things for over 100 years. Not because all of a sudden in the 21st century they're important, because, but because they're good for children. And they form the foundation of good teaching and learning practices. And so I always personally have a real issue with um, the nomenclature of 21st century skills because I can tell you that with the exception of the two yellow highlighted areas, and arguably even just the one on the right in terms of modern technologies, these are the same skills that people who built the pyramids had to exhibit when they were working in collaboration. And, and what feels really good is that now the nation is becoming enlightened to the importance of these things, which is a real testament to what we at Bank Street have been doing for a really long time. So collaboration, teamwork, creativity, imagination, critical thinking, and problem solving. And I just want to say a little bit about the extension of the unit that you just saw a little glimpse into in the eighth grade. This year, Ali, the teacher, has taken this unit one step further. And over the summer, she reached out to colleagues across the country and was looking for a willing partner in a red state who was also teaching civic education. And she found this teacher in a rural school deep in the heart of Virginia. And over the course of four 45-minute Skype sessions, our students have spoken to children in the South who are being raised in a very different bubble than the one that we reside in. And they've talked about issues from gun control to freedom of speech, First Amendment rights. And um, it's just been a fascinating journey to try to understand perspective of the other. And so that's back to the Margaret Wheatley quote. So um, it's a little bit of a frame for our work around the strategic planning. And I know you're all waiting with bated breath to hear <laughs> what is it that, uh, that we're going to focus on over the next five years. Um, and I know that in going into this, that I run the risk of um, exciting some and disappointing others. But before I even go there, I want to thank the members of the Strategic Planning Task Force, um, who, who um, you can come up here for the tomato growing with me, um, who, uh, who worked really hard over the past eight months, um, and in particular, over the last three months in engaging the larger community around feedback of the concepts that have emerged through our process. Um, so in particular, as you know, Emily Stein and Kate Sussman and Adrian Hill um, were three parent representatives to the task force and went overboard and over time in their um, engagement with you all as parents. So I want to have really much So, for those of you who were able to attend one of those sessions, I just want to re-situate the purpose of strategic planning for everybody. Um, there's really a number of reasons why organizations engage in this process. And the first is, is really to energize the community around a finite number of key priorities that we are going to get really excited about and good at. And so all of the community engagement starting my first year, last year, around just listening to folks and really trying to get a pulse on the place, to this year refining those ideas into some key focus areas, that has been really important. <coughs> Moving forward, when we have a strategic framework in place, it helps us as leaders make decisions. How do we prioritize our resources? And you've heard me say this, but really they fall into four categories, time, treasure, talent, and turf. And so by having a strategic framework, it helps decide what are we going to invest in in terms of our professional development time and resources. When we realize that there's the need for additional programming or staffing, this gives us a really good lens for how to make those decisions. The third category um, is it actually 
helps with accountability, which, you know, in some progressive circles, that's a bad word. I'm not a believer in that. Um, I think, actually, it's really important that we be accountable to the things that we say that we're um, committed to. And so, moving forward from this day, each year at the State of the School Address, it's my responsibility to share with you as the community, how are we doing against the things that we said that we're taking on. And then lastly, and this is not a driver, but it's certainly a benefit, um, at the bottom what you'll see is that in 2014, Bank Street has it had its decennial accreditation visit from NYSEG, which is the New York State Association of Independent Schools. And um, one of the areas where we got dinged um, was that we didn't actually have a strategic plan. We didn't have long-range planning to show the visiting team, and now we will. And uh, just as a sidebar, we are having our five-year visit in the fall. Um, that's also one of the reasons why we have about 37 fire drills every year, is that we didn't have enough before, so now we do. We're making up for lost time. Um, so, um, just in terms of where we are in the process, uh, what you'll see is that at the top, it was really about ideation. How do we generate the key ideas that are going to land us with a framework for moving forward? And now, and over the course of the past several months, we've gotten input from over 300 individuals um, across all of our stakeholder groups, which is amazing. It's a sign that people really care. And your feedback has been essential in shaping our thinking. Um, so in the bottom, what you'll see is we're going from ideation to implementation and ultimately impact, sort of the continuum of eyes, ideation, implementation, impact. And so um, um, I'm going to show with you, share with you where we, where we are. Um, the feedback from the community was really robust. And um, much of it was qualitative, but we also wanted to quantify it in a way that was helpful and meaningful. And so what you see here is two different slices at the data that we received from parents, faculty, and students. And, um, and on the left-hand column, it is the beginning of annual Animal Farm, where all animals are created equal. And on the right-hand column, it's but some animals are more equal than others. And so if we just did a sort of equal weighting to students, parents, and faculty, what you'll see is, and, and by the way, the score is, uh, we ask people to rank from one to nine based on the strategic priorities. What is your top priority? What's your lowest priority? So the closer to one in terms of score means it's the highest priority, and then we just rank that. Um, so on the left, what you'll see is, is um, with all constituents having equal weight. And then on the right, what we did was um, weighted it slightly differently, where adults had more voice than children, which is somewhat antithetical to a child-centered school. Um, and the kids were amazing, by the way. Um, and three of them were on the task force, and, and wow. Uh, um, but what, what we did was three, basically three parts faculty, two parts parent, and, two, and one part student. But regardless of which way we slice it, what you'll see is the top five are the top five. Right? So that's good. That's helpful. Um, so those are the top five with which we really move forward to articulate this framework that I'm going to share with you. Um, so what Lucy Sprague Mitchell said in the founding credo of Bank Street is that we need to operate with the courage to work unafraid and efficiently in a world of new ideas, sorry, new needs, new problems, and new ideas. Sounds a lot like what, what Margaret Wheatley shared. Um, and uh, what you'll probably recall is that in the fall, we published a long overdue new sort of view book for Bank Street, which we gave the title of Where Progressive Education Begins. And what I'm excited about in terms of the strategic plan is that it allows us to go into our growing edges. A good strategic plan isn't just an affirmation of what we already do well. It's tackling the big issues 
that allow us to continue to grow in a world of new challenges. And so, this is not official, it's kind of corny, but it, I like it. Um, so if, if, if this was where we are, then the strategic plan is how we continue. Um, so, with that being said, and it's important to acknowledge that all of this is operating within the context of the larger strategic plan of the college, and there are two areas where that plan impacts the School for Children really directly. One was the expansion, which seems to be influencing everything that we do and every move that we make. And the other was that the, the college as a whole really doubled down on issues of diversity. And so um, what you'll see here is that there's a line at the top that cuts across the whole framework, which is about diversity, equity, and, and social justice. We don't believe that that is a set of work that stands alone. It has to be a lens on what we do across all aspects of our work. And so that's really important. But we put it in three C's. We categorize it slightly differently. So there's a category of children, category of culture, and category of curriculum. And it's quite likely that even beyond this five-year plan that those are the three major categories that will continue to be um, the anchors of any strategic framework. So in the children category, um, what, and this is again, we're, we're, we have new challenges. The world is different. And so there's been a lot of learning in recent years about how the chemistry of children's brains has evolved. Neurodiversity, much more knowledge about um, different learning styles. And as a school, that's an area where we have some growth to do. How do we meet the needs of each and every child? What, do, what are the implications of that for how we differentiate our instruction? So that's a really big focus area. As we move to this middle category, which is around culture, it's culture at the level of children and adults. And what we heard resoundingly clearly from parents and also from faculty and kids is that um, you may not know this, but we have a very clearly articulated set of community expectations. It's beautiful, actually. The question is, how do we live into that? And how do we have a shared understanding as children progress across the grades in a way that is developmentally appropriate? So um, to have a shared behavioral framework that allows for clarity around our norms and expectations, but also allows us as adults to intervene when there are transgressions in a way that is um, developmentally appropriate. And then down a bit, but no less important in the culture category, is making sure that we continue to nourish, nurture, develop, and support our staff. Um, because their culture is at the essence of all that we do. As you move to the right category, um, which is curriculum, there's really two aspects of curriculum that we're going to go for. One is um, really ratcheting up our understanding of STEAM. And if you go back to the 21st century skills that I mentioned earlier, the two bolded areas, I think really what we're talking about as 21st century are the new technologies that, um, that are essential to living and learning and growing in, in this moment and era. And so as an institution, that has not been a priority historically, although I will say that we've had a maker space for um, many, many years. It's been the wood shop. But now that we, we know that there are new tools and technologies that our ch children are already facile with, um, but could use some additional instruction around, we're excited about STEAM and advancing our, our learning and work, our work in that area. Um, I'm excited to announce that there's the formation of a STEAM task force that will be co-chaired by Charlie, and our, who's our director of technology and, and one of our arts teachers, and uh, we are going to invite parent participation in that as we move forward. Um, and I'm also very grateful to those of you who came to the benefit this year and contributed to the grant a wish which was uh, we raised over fifty thousand dollars to support this new initiative. Um, we also, the eighth grade 
Um, class gift is devoted to this as well, and I'm very grateful to the parents of the eighth grade who are contributing to that cause. Down below in the curriculum section is really about alignment and articulation. So um, in a progressive school, we encourage exploration and experimentation, and we know that we want children to have a set of experiences that is not strictly a function of which teacher they happen to get in a given year. And so um, we have work to do around both horizontal, meaning within grade level, and vertical, meaning across grade levels, in terms of our curriculum. And we made a huge step forward this past summer with the publication of curriculum statements for all of our grades. Hopefully you've received that. And that work will serve as the foundation for moving forward. I do want to, so that's, that's the culmination. That, that's kind of the, that's the easy part. Um, um, but moving forward, what are we going to do? So we're going to be forming faculty working groups around these key strategic areas. And we have a very extensive concept paper written for each of these ideas. And what the faculty will be doing is taking the best thinking that emerged through the ideation phase and, and distilling it down into key, the key objectives in a sequenced way that will have milestones and so forth. So um, um, over the summer, we'll be writing an official plan that will be circulated and published, and, uh, and you should be looking forward to that. And then as I mentioned earlier, we will be reporting on progress annually in many forms, but certainly at the state of the school. It's exciting. And thank you really for your help in getting us to this point. So Bank Street by the numbers shifting to um, some data. Uh, what you see on this slide is the outcomes of our current eighth grades high school um, process. And what you'll see is we have a class of 40, and the distribution, just so for those who can't read the small print, the gray at the top is boarding schools. The um, orange in the middle is independent day schools. And then the blue category are public schools. So you can see that we're fairly consistent over the past three years in terms of the number and percentage of our kids that go to those three types of school places. Um, this slide is, is uh, showing you where our current eighth graders are actually going next year in terms of independent schools. And so, um, I know it's small print, it's hard to read. Um, but what we, what we did is we put this in descending order of frequency. In other words, at the top, from this year's class, the most number of kids will be matriculating. So you can see, for example, that four are going to French Seminary and LREI, um, and then three to Fieldston and so forth. And then you can see the previous two years in terms of the scatter of where kids went as well. Um, and then this is selected public schools. You know, the high school process in New York City is something. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we're really grateful to the work that Abby Gurney has done with each of our families and students. But in the selected public arena, this is where you have to apply. There's a process. Um, but you can see, again, in descending order of this year's grade, where our, where our kids will go. So the, the, the takeaway from all of this is that 40 students will be matriculating at 27 different schools which we believe is evidence of our ability to support each family and each child in finding the right fit for them. So um, I want to go to admissions. And uh, this is a, a five-year view of the total number of applications that we've received, um, the percentage of each of the, of the total number of applications that are asking for some form of financial aid, the number of new students that are enrolling, and then also what the attrition rates have been. And um, um, this is just empirical data. I can, um, I'm going to call attention to a couple of things. One is that uh, you can see that there has been a decline since 2014-15 in the total number of applications. Last year was a bit of an anomaly because the Mandel School closed. And we received 40 applications from Mandel a year ago. The other thing is that the 390 that you see is, um, is, is 
year to date. And even though the official admission cycle has concluded, we continue to receive applications for families that are moving to New York um, over the course of the spring months. So that number will go up. Um, and you'll also see that there's a trend towards more families requesting financial aid since 2014 to the present. Um, in terms of attrition, it's, it's pretty um, stable in terms of 4 to 5 percent each year. That all being said, we had a really good year with admissions. And I want to thank Anita and Jessica and Ronnie and um, everyone else on the team, Elsie, for working really hard. We incorporated a number of new elements this year, um, particularly to drive up interest in our pre-K programs. There's, a, there's some new factors out there in the world that are different than what existed before. With the advent of universal pre-K, some families are waiting longer to choose tuition um, airing schools. Uh, there's more competition in the Upper West Side with some like-minded schools having moved into our vicinity. Uh, and birth rates are down in Manhattan. So these are real issues that we are grappling with and with, you know, not to mention the rising cost of tuition. Um, so, so we feel really good about the fact that we, um, we made a, an adjustment a year ago around tuition in the threes, fours, because we were way north of our peer set. And so we adjusted the tuition, and you can see that we've gone back to our target enrollment of 16, which feels great. Um, we also did a number of targeted open houses and events for, um, for specifically that population of families. And um, we're slightly down in the fours, fives by, by choice, because the interest in the five, sixes is, is really great. And that was true this year as well as last year. So rather than just fill seats, we're actually going to hold off in some areas um, to make uh, to hold spots when there's when there's a more competitive pool, and um, and and so that's where we are. But overall, since the expansion happened, the enrollment of the school for children has gone from 437 to 470, um, which is a net increase of uh, 33 students. And so we're moving in that direction. Um, I do want to say that parent participation in admissions is essential and um, there's two very specific requests that I'm going to make of you. One is there's nothing more meaningful to prospective families perhaps than um, the students themselves but then families coming to, to be part of the tour process. And so um, when we reach out we really do need you. Um, it's an essential part of how we shepherd people into Bank Street, and, and your involvement is, is really important. Um, the same is true with buddy families. So um, as we do enroll new families, we need people to help onboard them to our community, and so we, we are grateful for your participation in that way. And then, the, I guess I said two, but there's really a third, which is that we're, um, we're going to be convening in the next month uh, a marketing and admissions roundtable and basically for those of you who have expertise in your own professional lives about how to get the word out in a strategic way that might tap families that might not know about or be inclined to think about Bank Street we need your expertise and so stay tuned for an invitation to that and if you're interested please reach out to Kate Marcus um, who's our director of communications uh, Ideas such as having house parties in areas of the city where we don't have a critical mass of people. We're, we're open to thinking about creative solutions in terms of busing and transportation, those kinds of things um, to make Bank Street um, attractive to families that might not otherwise think about us. So moving to financial aid, um, this is also significant. I'm really proud of the fact, and this, this I, I, I love the socioeconomic diversity of this community, and we should be really proud of the fact that we are outside the norm of independent schools in terms of that aspect of our community identity. And so what you can see, again, is an increase in the total percentage of students that are receiving financial aid from 15, 16, from 30% to 38%. And then on the right-hand side, um, it's a comparison to our peer schools in New York City. So. Um, we, we, this is based on 2017-18, because 18-19 is still a bit of a moving target, but 37% of our families receive aid here, 
24% of our peer set. Um, and then in terms of scholarship rate, that's basically, what that means is that, that at Bank Street, when we factor in financial aid, we're receiving all in, across all families, 78 cents on the dollar, versus um, in other independent schools, it's, it's 86, sorry, 85 cents on the dollar. So the spread is not as significant when we think about scholarship rate, rate than when we think about percentage on aid. Um, in terms of our racial diversity, and this is self-reported based on the categories that exist on the application, um, I'm also really proud that we are way north of the average in terms of our racial diversity at Bank Street, and that number has gone up every year. So currently, um, in 2017-18, we're 52% students who identify as white and 48% to identify as, um, as students of color. Next year, that number will be based on our current assessment, 5149. And then if you look at us against the peer set that we compare ourselves to, um, we're, we're really doing well. So the average and the median is 40%, we're at 48%. Um, and it'll be 49% next year. And um, that's good for everybody. So, moving to everybody's favorite topic. Um, tuition and finance. Um, so we did do this year a full presentation about finance and tuition, which was robust, and those of you that attended, I think, not only benefited, but also offered some really meaningful feedback to us. And that talk was, um, was taped. So you can access it. I'm not going to go through all of it, but we, we, have, we will make the materials available. But I do want to provide some high-level information from that conversation. Um, what you can see here is dating back to 2013-14, three things really. One is what the rate of tuition increase has been. And it's fluctuated between last year's 4.5% increase to 5.8% in 14-15. So we're sort of in a range of four to four and a half to six percent. Um, the next line is what faculty salary increases have been over the same period. Um, we are currently in union negotiations. For those of you who don't know, Bank Street has a union. That's great. Um, um, but no, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, and so they're they're near, they're concluding the end of the current three-year contract, and we're we're in bargaining with them now. So that's why it says PBD. But um, there's been different ways that we've sliced it over the years in terms of a percent, a share percentage increase versus a, um, a step number. And, uh, and then the other pieces that you can see, as all of you know in your own lives, that healthcare costs have really skyrocketed in recent years. Um, so that's one answer to the question of why does tuition keep going up. Um, but I wanted to, this is a very, this is a single slide that captures a, a lot of information. I'm going to do my very best to make it clear to you all what's going on here. So, um, in the left area, number one, um, what we did was a, an analysis of how Bank Street's cost structure compares to standalone independent schools to determine and disprove some of the long-standing mythology that somehow the School for Children is subsidizing other programs within the college. And what we found is that actually because of the cost of facilities primarily, that there's a cost savings to us by being part of a shared organization. And so each year we save about $3,300 per student simply by virtue of being in a shared space with the graduate school and, and the other programs. Um, so what do we do with that $3,300? And how do we put that money to use to distinguish ourselves programmatically? Well, there's two primary areas that we put that money. One is that we have a teacher-rich model that is unparalleled in the independent school world. And that is true across the board, but particularly in the upper school, where you have two head teachers in classrooms of about 20 students. 
And that, that just doesn't exist across the sector. Um, but even in the lower and middle grades, uh, with the assistant teacher model, we're, we're, um, we have a really rich teaching approach. And then the other area where that money goes to work is in allowing for the kind of socioeconomic diversity that I explained previously. Um, because we put that money towards financial aid, um, we're able to have a community of families that we feel is reflective of the reality of the world much more so than, than our peers. And even still, with all of that, when we actually cost out what our average tuition is, and the reason it says 46.7, that's based on this year's, we're, we're averaging out lower, middle, and upper school where there's slightly different um, tuition amounts. We're still short of the total cost of educating a child by a margin of $3,900. Yeah, sit with that for a second. Um, so we realize that it's expensive to go here and in addition to the cost of tuition, we're also dependent on other forms of revenue. And those forms of revenue really are dependent on philanthropy. So to that point, go to everybody's next favorite topic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the different ways of giving in a school like ours. So the, the upper left is the annual fund. And in... <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, the annual fund is... Um, is the platinum version of fundraising for us because those are dollars that get put to use immediately. They're unrestricted and they allow us to do the incredible things that we do at Bank Street. Um, and we really are driving for 100% parent participation this year. I'll talk about that in a second more where we are. Um, there are other ways that people can give. Event tickets and related fundraising. So coming to the, to the benefit or the B or buying an auction item those are important, but those also come with a cost to us because there are costs associated to running those events. And so that money is, all your support is very welcome and appreciated. Um, but that's, that does not substitute for a gift to the annual fund. The next category is endowment gifts. So that's money that is for a particular purpose, unless it's the general endowment. But that money gets put to use later as, um, as we only benefit from the revenue that's generated from the corpus of the investment. And then the last category is um, other restricted gifts. So for example, the eighth grade class gift towards the STEAM lab. And, um, and so those are the four pathways of giving. And uh, you know, this, this is a dashboard of where we've been in terms of annual giving within the School for Children over the last six years. And I do want to highlight that last year was not a banner year for us. Um, it's important to be transparent with you all. It was a year of transition. I was new. Um, we lost our director of development midstream, and we did not meet our goal. And um, we need to do better. We need to do better this year. And so um, we're dependent on your gifts. And this year, to date, what you'll see is a pie chart of giving. Um, and again, sorry for the small font, but um, the blue 54% is what's been contributed thus far to the annual fund. We do appeal to people other than parents for the annual fund too, so you need to know that. And then the other three are the, the events that we've done this year. So the green is the fall fair, the, the light blue is the Bank Street B, and the, and the orange is the benefit. Thank you to all the parents who um, organized those events. They were wonderful. Um, yeah. So um, year-to-date parent participation, April 20th, 2018, we're at 43%. That's both, that's like good news and bad news, right? The, 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 the good news is that we still have 57% of you who can help us get to our goal. The bad news is that we want that number to be closer to 100. Um, and so you are uh, going to be hearing from us. Lots. There's a table out in the lobby right now. Um, so when you 
walk away here feeling great about Bank Street, which you will. Um, it's a good time to make your gift. Um, but, uh, you know, our goal for this year is 825, and we have a ways to go, and we're really dependent on your support, and it goes directly to work for your kids. So please do make your gift. Any denomination is valuable to us. And we really want to get to 100%. That's a personal goal. Um, so highlights from this year. Uh, I always love talking about adult learning and professional development, and this is a place of my own personal passion. So last summer, and this is a tradition that we're going to continue, and I do want to say that, uh, that, that I have a really interesting idea, which is to have parents be invited into the summer reading next summer so that we can have some cross-constituent book groups. But last summer we chose three books that we used for framing our professional inquiry this year. Um, one was called Becoming Nicole, so it's a story about a child's journey to becoming trend, to, to, to being her full self. Um, and then uh, Difficult Conversations. Um, sometimes we live in a culture of nice, and it doesn't allow us to move as quickly as we need to. So getting um, some facility around that. And then the third was about Lost and Found, which is helping behaviorally challenged students and, and while we're at it, everybody else. That's the subtitle. Um, and so right now, I'm, I'm seeking recommendations from faculty. These all came from faculty, who, um, and, and we'll do that again next summer. Uh, summer curriculum grants is a proud tradition at Bank Street, where each year around this time, we invite faculty to submit proposals to do meaningful work, either to document curriculum that's already happened or develop new curriculum. And out of that has come some really amazing work this year, for example, in the 7-8, um, the Fractured Fairy Tale Unit um, was, was a direct function of the, of the summer curriculum grant. Both in the 10s, 11s, and the 13s, 14s, there was really thorough, comprehensive um, documentation of how we teach math. And, uh, and so um, it's been an important and ongoing part of how we think about professional work. Critical Friends Group is something that we launched this year, which um, 12 teachers and leaders were trained last summer to facilitate collaborative inquiry. Um, and then three times over the course of the year, we met as cross grade level teams to look at adult and student work. We just did a survey and 83% of the faculty found that to be really meaningful and want to continue and make that practice even more embedded in what we do. Um, Strategic planning has consumed a lot of our time this year as a faculty. Uh, we've done a lot of work around gender and sexuality and diversity as part of our work on social justice. Um, our teachers go all over the country to present their work. The National Association of Independent Schools Conference, Nice Days Workshops, the National Council for Social Studies, the National Council for the Teaching of Mathematics. Our teachers are out and about and coveted as presenters. Um, and so that's also really exciting. And then, um, if you ever wonder what is it that we do when your kids are home with you, driving you nuts on these professional development days, I'm going to just share with you a little glimpse of this. So when you think you know this. 
one thing about your story you know you want to be in there. How many think you might start your story? <laughs> How fun to dance with colleagues in this kind of shared understanding. That was actually my first eye movie. It was really fun to make it. Um, um, so we have fun and we learn when we have these professional development days. Um, so I want to talk about hiring update. And, uh, and so the, the, this is the past year of a ton icon. You can see that. Um, um, really what I want to focus you like that? Um, um, what I want to tell you is that the virtual backpack is a wealth of information. I, you know, it's more become like the virtual trunk um, <laughs> lately. But, uh, but in that publication each week, we're providing updates on staffing changes. And um, so today, what I want to share is that, uh, as you know, we had a change in the middle school division head. And I want to thank George Burns, who is over there. for um, basically serving as a flotation device for us for the <laughs> last several months and um, bringing such strength and stability during a period of transition. Thank you. Um, it's been great work. Um, we have hired Preeti Feibinger to be our new middle school division head. We're super excited about her arrival. Many of you have met her. She's going to be great. Um, in the reading specialist department, Ellie Costa is um, moving to Massachusetts, and we've hired a wonderful person who's brain street trained named Emily Shotland. Um, we're also excited to share that we have budgeted for additional support in reading to reach more classrooms and more children. Um, yeah. Um, seven, eight, um, we're sad that Lila Mortimer is leaving Bank Street, but she has an incredible opportunity to um, put to work her math leadership degree and um, start a new position at the Spence School to be their math coordinator in the lower school. Um, and we, this hasn't even come out yet because it was just confirmed yesterday, um, but Barthi Baral, who is a very experienced teacher from Fieldston Lower School, knows Preeti well um, and has extensive experience in second grade, is going to be our third member of the 7 8 team. You'll we'll hear more about her. She's, she's amazing, um, so she'll be joining. Dory and Danette as our 7 8 team. In the 8s 9s, Laura Balabushka is going on leave for, uh, uh, to be a parent to her first child. And we're really excited that Shaler Johnson, who has been an assistant teacher both with Laura and this year with Becky, um, is, is moving into the head teaching role in the 7 8 She's incredible. Um, we have a number of searches that are nearing completion. Um, and uh, again, that's why you need to read the virtual backpack. But in lower school, we're, I'll talk a little bit more about this. The legendary Betsy is retiring. Um, so we're very close to finding the person that will be filling that role. Um, Allie Bruce is uh, going to be leaving the librarian position. And that search is a, a collaboration with our colleagues in the library. Um, Tracy Pearl is leaving the 9th, 10th math science role. Mordica. Sujimura is leaving the 12s, 13s math science position. Um, we're in the search for Rose Mead's replacement as the upper school French teacher, and we're getting very close on the school psychologist and, um, and director of high school placement and, and exhibitions positions. I will say that the school psychologist in the upper school, um, we're increasing that person's presence in the school. Mitch has been here two days a week, and we're uh, at least going to have this person here three days a week, so that's also exciting. Um, and then we have 
And just, just to situate this, that's, that's 11 departures. You might feel like there's some kind of crazy exodus. It's not really true. Last year we had nine overall, um, and I've checked with people. It's, it's, it's higher than typical, but it's not out of the range of normal, and we don't believe that it's a sign of anything other than people pursuing opportunities that really um, align with their interests. So um, the other thing I wanted to share is that next year we have five people who are eligible for sabbatical. It's one of the benefits of working at Bank Street. Um, the, the last union negotiations allowed for a, an option to do an intensive summer sabbatical as opposed to missing time from teaching. So the majority of these folks are doing that it means it won't impact staffing here. Um, and so that's Dave Mortimer, Schuber, Naranjo, and Tobias, um, and Janelle Giles. And then the one person who's actually taking a more traditional sabbatical is Erica Blumberg, our upper school music teacher, who will be on sabbatical second semester of next year. Um, so we'll have a period where we have the new person working with her as part of the transition. So that's the staffing update. Um, parenting education highlights, it's been a great year. I want to thank the Health and Wellness Committee, and particularly Christine Swee for her um, incredible effort in organizing a number of really timely and relevant workshops provided by an organization called Hallways. Um, and the topics that they have helped our community with, all of these are recorded so you can access them. Our consent, understanding anxiety and perfectionism, navigating complex social environments, raising empathetic children. And then also we have our monthly ongoing um, child development meetings. As a FYI to you parents, um, what we're doing to get a little bit of free advice with our two finalists for the upper school psychologist meeting is that we're going to have them do a child development meeting on a topic of their choosing, and you all will be invited to both participate and provide feedback on them. Um, so that will stay tuned for that in the next week or two. Um, and then we've done a lot of work on social justice as a whole community, including with parents. Um, one of the great highlights of this year was the Lord's Prayer for the visit. Um, And I do want to say that that was made possible by a generous donation from parents. So thank you for that. Um, and, uh, and so we've done the language values workshop. Our affinity groups are continuing and active. And then we, as a community, have done a lot of work around our understanding of gender and sexuality diversity. Um, I love this part of Bank Street's program and experience that we have four arts-based residencies beginning in the 9s, 10s, all the way through the 12s, 13s. It's one of the great benefits of going here and working here. In the 9s, 10s, we have the Dorothy Carter writer in residence. Yesterday they presented. My own sons are in that group. And um, Renee Watson was this year's presenter. And, uh, and at dinner the other night, he said to Todd, he said, Renee Watson really opened my mind to poetry. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and that's what these are meant to be. In the 10s and 11s, we do the Alex Cohen Performing Arts Residency, which is um, in honor of a Bank Street um, alum who was a major theater lover and who passed away well, way too soon. And his parents and their friends endowed this so that we could have a performing artist in residence. Um, the, the Laura Lensner Visual Art Residency, Laura was a parent of a school for children and, uh, and also a big advocate for the arts. So each year we bring in a visual artist to work with our, our sixth graders. And this year we had Yali Lin, who is a um, manga artist, and she did workshops with the kids and the faculty. And then each year we have this wonderful highlight with uh, this incredible uh, performing artist, poet, named Advocate for of Words, who and it culminates in our seventh graders performing at the New Rican Cafe in the Lower East Side, a really powerful experience. Um, so that's, and I will say what you don't see here is math science residencies. So part of our STEAM efforts is going to be to round out the type of people that our children are exposed to. Um, to also require your support. Um, so, uh, um, how am I doing, Dero? Good. Good, okay, good. Um, so, uh, I want to tell a quick story about calendar change, and I think this really crystallizes um, the best of progressive education. So for years and years, this institution has referred to that holiday in October as Columbus Day. And with increasing awareness of history and the retelling of history, our community has become sensitized to um, what 
names mean and what they represent. And so this fall, there was a lot of, especially a lot of, um, of, of discomfort with taking a day to honor a person who was part of the mass genocide and removal of native people. And so um, I put out a thing to faculty to say, how do we want to work on this? And, um, and the ninth tens bit and said, you know, in a traditional school, the adult people would fix this problem, but at Bank Street, the kids need to be at the center of it. And so the ninth tens took this on. They did an incredible amount of research. They looked at what other independent schools are doing. They looked at the history of Columbus, and they wrote this um, policy proposal. And for the first time in Bank Street's history, children presented to the cabinet, which is Shale, the president of the college, and all of the deans, and suggested that we change a policy. They were amazing. They were empowered. They knew that they could make change. Um, and they got conditional approval at that meeting, but it depended upon them doing some more work. So they had to go to an all-college meeting and present to the graduate school faculty and other um, constituents within the college. They presented at a school for children faculty meeting, and each time they got more empowered. And I'm proud to say that when you see the release of next year's calendar, it's going to say Indigenous People's Day, not Columbus Day. Um, the website is really happening, the new website. It's exciting. Um, that's a preview. This has been a labor of something um, over, <laughs> over the uh, past many months. Kate has, has uh, um, bared the, the bulk of that something. Um, and uh, what we're doing is trying to be at first responsive to how do we compare with our sector. So we all know that the current site is, is a mess. Um, and uh, we want, each division of the college wants a site that is really reflective of the unique nature of that division. So ours is going to look like an independent school site, easily navigable, easy to access, um, and you'll, you're going to love it. Later in the process will be the internal workings of the site, the parent portal. Um, that's not part of phase one, so stay tuned for that. And then, um, I mentioned earlier, but in the fall we'll be seeing um, Nice safes for the five-year reaccreditation visit. Some facilities highlights really quickly. Um, we're not doing any major, major work this summer, hallelujah. Um, but there is always work to be done in New York City and buildings. And so one of the things that we're working on is um, local law 11, which requires that we repair the facade of the building. That work will be ongoing. We're going to replace, fully replace one of the elevators. Um, we did not put down the right floors on the second and third floor initially two summers ago as part of the renovation, so we're going to make that right based on what we've learned from the fourth and seventh floors. And then um, we're, other parts of the college are putting in permanent displays for, um, for artwork. And then as you look ahead to the summer of 19, what we did is we held off on the lobby renovations for a lot of reasons, um, time, treasure, and talent um, included. And so, uh, but, but in the summer of 19, we will be refreshing the lobby, um, doing new lighting and thinking about the entryway and the main stairwell. Um, and then we're also going to be working in the family center hallway to improve flooring and lighting and finishing the second elevator. And then moving forward, there's other work that is on as part of the capital plan, graduate school admissions office, um, the fourth floor steam lab, which uh, we're really excited about. Uh, refreshing the two rooms over here that sometimes parents meet in when room 109, and then the cafeteria as well. So fun facts, really quick. Um, I did this last year, but I love it. So two thirds of our teachers have earned group, uh, master's degrees at Bank Street. 13 faculty members, we call ourselves the Many Hats Club, send their own children to the School for Children or the Family Center. Seven faculty members within children's programs went here as children at, to the School for Children. And then we have 12 current, this might be low, um, but that number is higher, and counting um, parents who, who went here as children who send their children here. And that's kind of the best testament to what we do. Um, I'm going to skip that. <laughs> Thank you.
So if, to me, the best sign of a healthy school is happy children. And um, I think that was what we saw, not only on March 16th, the Spirit Day, but really every day. We have kids who can't wait to come to school and who are excited to see their friends and their teachers. And um, as the head of the school and as a parent, that is what keeps me going every day. So that's the official end of the presentation. Um, oh, no, it's not. This is really important. <laughs> Hey, so Betsy Blatchley is retiring um, after 42 wonderful years at Bank Street, and we are doing a lot to celebrate her. She deserves it. She is a, uh, she is just an icon and embedded in the fabric of this place. So we are actually establishing a new endowment, the Betsy Blatchley Fund, which will allow for us to bring in a music-based residency to the lower school. Um, moving forward. And so, a couple of things that we, I want to share, and you'll be getting information about this shortly. But on Friday, June 1st, we're having a, a multi-generational song party and retirement party where we're inviting current families um, and students to a, uh, a sing-along from 4.30 to 5.30, and then from 7 o'clock on that evening, we're having a big alumni gathering to celebrate Betsy and her many, many years of service to Bank Street with an all-star band, including some people in this room, but also special guests, Nancy Silver and Tony Saul, who wrote Revels, um, and were teachers here for a long time who are coming back. So mostly we want you to come and celebrate Betsy, but also um, as, we, as we kick off this endowment for music in the lower school, um, your support would also be really helpful. That really was the end. <laughs> Um, so, we have a few minutes for questions, and I'm really happy to go anywhere that folks would like. Wow, oh, two years in a row. I know you have questions, but I'll take that. Silence. Um, I'm always available if people are interested in learning more, sharing questions, bringing concerns, um, and uh, our day is, it's a great day for a march, by the way, I don't know if you all know this, but it's uh, in about 45 minutes, our lower school kids are leading a march for peace, kindness, and friendship. It was safety, but it's friendship now. Um, um, and, uh, and they have planned this whole march down to Riverside Park with song, singing and song. It's the day of the National School Walkout. Our eighth graders are actually joining classmates from across the city in Washington Square, uh, and they will be back for play rehearsal this afternoon. Um, but, uh, but it's another great day at Bank Street, so thank you all for being here.